Speak up. Selfish program. It's all about you. If you want to do it, speak up. Open your mouth. Don't shut up. Talk, 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 talk. There's, there's, a, there's magic in the spoken word. What goes on in your head doesn't make sense until you speak it. That was Adam Jasinski, and this is The Share Podcast. It's time for The Share Recovery Podcast, where we bring you amazing life-changing success stories from addicts and alcoholics all over the world who share their inspiring journey in recovery. And now, here's your host, O. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Share Podcast. And today, we have Adam Jasinski joining us on the show. And Adam is the grand prize winner on the CBS reality show, Big Brother Season 9. And this episode is a cautionary tale of what happens when you win a tremendous amount of money and are just completely unprepared to deal with fame and fortune all in one giant dose. In 2008, he won his grand prize, and by 2009, Adam was arrested outside Boston and charged with attempting to sell 2,000 pills of oxycodone and was facing a maximum of 20 years in prison with a $1 million fine. This interview is a true cautionary tale. Adam takes us through his roller coaster ride that is his life battling with bipolar disease, addiction, and his time served in prison. So let's dive into Adam's story. But before we dive into Adam's story, something interesting happened last week that I wanted to, that I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, I was invited to go on the Dopey Podcast. I don't know how many of you listen to the Dopey Podcast, but it's a pretty extreme podcast that talks about drug addiction, recovery, and other dumb shit. That's kind of their tagline. And when I f- was first invited, I listened to a few episodes prior to responding to them. And I was like, wow, this is kind of a little, you know, this is, this is a very different, this is a very different take on addiction. It's more edgy. It's a little more hardcore. And wasn't sure if I felt comfortable doing the show. But the cool thing was that I recently quit my job of being in the online casino and sportsbook industry for the last over 15 years. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I live in Costa Rica. Um, And it's not something that I like to talk about. It's not something that I feel is congruent with my spiritual principles. And and finally, when I quit, uh, I really wanted to talk about it. I felt like the Dopey Podcast was a great forum for me to kind of unleash and be uncensored. And it did give me a platform to share open and honestly about a lot of the shit that went on when I was using and a lot of the stuff that that went on in my life, you know, being clean and, and being in the gambling industry. So I really enjoyed doing the podcast, and what's funny was that immediately after I did the podcast, I got, I got a message, somebody posted in iTunes a review, uh, and somebody sent me an email, so I want to read those to you guys. The first one was the iTunes review, and it says, uh, great interview on the Dopey Podcast, cannot wait to hear what you do following the departure from casino bookie stuff. It won't be share full time, so please come back on Dopey in a year's time and let us know how you went. I tried share, but it's a bit too positive for me. I've cut back my drugs and alcohol, but I'll never quit entirely. So it's hard for me to hear the happiness of your shares all the time. And that message was from listener number 33. Uh, Thanks for the message, brother. I really appreciate it. And yes, I'd love to be on the Dopey Podcast again to give you guys all an update on what's going on. I'll certainly be updating the Share Podcast with my most recent updates, that's for sure. And on a side note, uh, for my interview on the Dopey Podcast, the way Chris and Dave open up is with them paying tribute to their friend Dave, who recently died of a drug overdose. Again, another cautionary tale of not taking the disease of addiction seriously. And regardless of their podcast format... Chris and Dave are both in recovery, both are advocates for 12-step recovery, both would not be clean today if it wasn't for 12-step recovery. So regardless of the media that you use or the, or the outlet that you gravitate towards, at the end of the day, we're all talking about recovery and what I feel is the bridge to getting your ass to a meeting. You know, there's so many people that are reluctant to go to meetings, uh, my family doesn't want me to go. I don't feel comfortable in the meetings. I don't know. I, I think I should go to rehab. I think I should go. You know, people are willing to spend all kinds of money on alternative ways of getting clean and sober. But man, if you just show up at a meeting 
and get yourself a sponsor and work the steps, you don't need any of that. Anyway, that's just me. I, I don't want a soapbox. So let me just read uh, the email I got. And it says, just wanted to say, I love your podcast and also Dopey. It was so amazing to have my two favorite podcasts together. Cool to find out that you were in the sportsbook business. I could tell that you had a little bit of a crazy past, but it was cool to identify with your wildness while using. Thanks for doing Dopey and keep doing what you're doing. And that email was from Scott. Thanks so much for the email and for the love, brother. Hope to be on the Dopey podcast again soon. Um, At the end of the day, what's important is being able to reach out to people and connect with them. This is a disease of disconnection, man. And if you do not connect with people, then you're alone. And trying to get sober, trying to get clean on your own, as far as I'm concerned, is impossible. We need each other and we need some sort of a program, whatever you decide to choose. But you need a program, you need connection, and you need support. And that's basically what I wanted to, to get out to you guys. You know, that, uh, you know, I've been in Costa Rica for a long time and I've been in the online gambling business for a long time and it's not something that I'm proud of and it's not something that I've discussed before. But when I quit recently, man, um, it was the best decision I ever made in my life. And now my wife and I are going to open up a tattoo parlor. So that's the most exciting news of all. We're so excited and we can't wait. So uh, I'll be keeping you guys posted. Uh, as we start to build out the location, I'll be giving you guys updates. Um, it's an exciting time. And again, it's all because of recovery, man. All because of recovery. I'm trying to live a life based on spiritual principles. And everything I do in my life has to be congruent with those principles. So here we go. You know, as I get close to my 14 year anniversary next month, it's all exciting times. So without any further ado, let's dive into Adam's story. But first, if you have not yet rated and reviewed the Share Podcast, please, one of the best ways to help support the show is to go to iTunes, leave us a five-star rating and a review, and that helps catapult us up the ratings on iTunes, which will make it easier for more and more people to find the Share Podcast. Now, in the past, many of you have asked, hey, oh, how can I help support the show? Well, I'm going to keep it simple for you. The first way is by donating via PayPal or Bitcoin. And of course, I want to thank all of our listeners who have been generously donating every month to the Share Podcast. Make no mistake about it, you guys are making a huge difference. But again, we can always use more, and now you can even send us donations using Bitcoin. So if you go to the website, www.thesharepodcast.com, on the top right corner, there's a donate button. Click on that button and it'll take you to the page where you can donate either by PayPal or by Bitcoin. On a weekly basis, I have over 5,000 listeners every week who listen to the Share Podcast. So if 100 of you guys would send me $5 a month or more, there are a few listeners that are sending $10, $20, and even $50 every month, that would completely support the show from beginning to end. So for those of you who have the wherewithal to send me $5, either by PayPal or by Bitcoin, then by all means, please feel free to donate now. We could really use the support. Also, when you're purchasing stuff on Amazon, there are those of you that are still clicking on the Amazon link on the Share Podcast website before doing their purchases on Amazon. But again, there are thousands of you listening. If each and every one of you could just remember to go to the Share website, click on the Amazon button before you do your shopping, that is also going to make a tremendous difference for us financially. So I haven't been one to emphasize it in the past, right? But now we've got a solid listener base. I know you guys love the show. I know you guys get a lot out of it. There are those of you just like in the meetings that are newcomers, the money's tight. Keep listening. The show will always be for free. The Share Podcast private accountability group will always be for free. But for those of you who can, kick in a couple of bucks. Help us out here. And not to forget the Share Podcast private accountability group. Again, it's growing like crazy. Guys, go to the Share Podcast, www.thesharepodcast. Click on the button that says join the Facebook private group. For those of you that are in the private accountability group, you know 
how vital and important that has become. There's over 1,500 members in there. If you don't want to go to meetings, if you have problems connecting with people, if you need something more than just the podcasts and are not ready to cross over into meetings or some other structured program, then the Private Accountability Group is perfect for you. Jump in there, make comments, ask questions, or just read the posts. There are so many people out there that have the same questions that you have. All you have to do is just read those and then read all the follow-up answers and responses that come. And make sure to subscribe to my weekly newsletter so you know every single time a brand new episode is launched. And of course, if you have any questions, just email me, o at the sharepodcast.com, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. So now a quick message from our sponsors, and then on to the show. Would you like to join a free, anonymous online group that offers a daily topic email with popular recovery resources accompanied by a secret Facebook group for discussion? Then go to dailyaaemails.com for more information about Transitions Daily. And don't forget to share dailyaaemails.com with friends, in meetings, and with sponsees in recovery. Sober Nation is the largest online recovery community and treatment resource center. They provide treatment resources to those struggling with addiction, as well as to the family members who are caught in the crossfire. On top of that, Sober Nation is a huge community of good people who share their experience with each other. They have informative content, recovery and addiction news, as well as an entire clothing line which helps expand the culture of recovery. They can easily be found at www.SoberNation.com. Sober Nation is putting recovery on the map. Hey Adam, thanks for joining us. Hey, how you doing man? Nice to be a part of this. Excellent, excellent. How you feeling today? I'm okay. Long days every day. But, uh, <laughs> I'm back in the saddle ready to talk about, you know, sobriety and the benefits of it and how everybody can enjoy their life and have fun still. I hear you. Know, you. I hear you. banged up every day. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, folks, today we have Adam Jasinski joining us on the Share Podcast. Adam earned a $500,000 prize on the CBS TV series Big Brother Season 9 in 2008. And on October 19, 2009, Adam was arrested and charged by the DEA in North Reading, Massachusetts, with possession of 2,000 oxycodone pills with intent to distribute. Adam admitted to funding his illegal venture with the $500,000 winnings from the show and to buying and reselling oxycodone pills for several months. Jasinski faced a maximum of 20 years in prison and a $1 million fine. Heavy, heavy stuff, Adam. Woo. Heavy. Did I get all the details right? Yeah. What a, what a, what a, what a dark cloud that was. <laughs> was like, Jesus. See you later. Absolutely. Actually, I actually got off probation last week. Oh, no kidding. Uh-huh. Dude, that's... years probation. What a... Wow. What a yeah. 2017. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I for, it, it was so long, I forgot about it already. I'm like, oh, I'm on probation still? It's like, you don't even realize it at some point. But Dude, I love I, it. Listen, I paid my... I paid the cost. I did what I had to do. And like I was telling you earlier, you know, I quit smoking cigarettes. I said to myself the day I went, they locked me back up. I said, this is my last cigarette. I said... If I'm going to do four years in jail, I'm going to quit smoking cigarettes so I can live four years longer. You know nice. I mean? Nice. So you're done so, with the cigarettes. I paid it back. Yeah, I, I bought my time back, I guess. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. All right, folks. So prepare yourselves. We're in for a bit of a roller coaster here. So uh, let's get started. You ready to dive right in? Dive right in. Whatever you want to know, I'm here to tell you. Okay. So per- first of all, give us a snapshot of what your daily routine looks like, including recovery. For me, it it, it got hit. When I got locked up that day on October 10th, I was laying in the jail cell, and I was more pissed off that I couldn't do coke no more. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yep. Than getting in trouble. I was like, what the fuck was I thinking, you know? (sighs) So I'm laying there. I'm like, damn, I can't. I mean, that's it. I'm done. I was literally depressed because I couldn't do coke anymore. So for me, it was, you know, I got locked up. I went to a rehab for the first time. Uh, for a six-month inpatient. And then when I got out, I went to University of Pennsylvania and actually to a, a, a mental health program. I applied for a study while I was out on, pr- on like parole or whatever before sentencing. And um, that's what difference my daily life is now. What I learned in the mental health outpatient program versus the, you know, the treatment substance abuse programming is what really changed my life. You know, there was certain things I wasn't doing in my daily routine that 
learning that through the mental health program for my bipolar just to manage it ke- keeps me free and clear of drugs for I'm good, man. I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I, I, I just have to go to bed every night. I need to sleep. I need to eat good. I need to go to the gym. I mean, I need to shut down after five o'clock, you know, every right. day and not work like a maniac 24 hours a day because my whole life was go, 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 go. And then to the point where, you know, something didn't go right or my body was just shut down. It was like, get high, you know, get high, get fucked up, you know, and I was a professional at like medicating myself for so many years just to manage my symptoms, you know, versus actually learning the program, learning why I do drugs, learning what the ideas of sobriety are and getting those fundamentals down, you know, applying them every day. And then on top of that, for me, it was, you know, the mental health component was a whole separate animal altogether. Right, right, right. So on a daily basis, because we were talking a little bit prior to the interview about, you know, how you work your recovery, how you work in your recovery right now, you mentioned something about your mom. Yeah, she owns a program um, here called Oceans Medical Centers. It's in uh, Wheaton Beach, Florida. And I mean, if anybody knows anything about South Florida, where you are, like the cesspool mecca of rehabilitation. And what rose above it that we saw down here and she saw lacking was the mental health component. So, you know, my day to day is pretty much involved chipping in and helping her out, you know, with the kids that come to, in our program, there's anywhere between 20 and 50 people in there that are really having a hard time. You know, they're 90% are under 30, like 30 days clean. And you really, and on top of that, they have, you know, whether it's somewhere in the spectrum of schizophrenia or mania, depression, bipolar, whatever they're there. And it's for me, it's like I get up and, that's what I involve myself and surround myself with every day. You know, it keeps me on track and keeps everything up front, you know, and see where they come from. And then the dynamic switches, I guess, you know, I'm not them anymore. I'm more so on the other side. So I'm more of like, wow, I can get that to these guys. Okay. So tell us how you maintain your spiritual condition, that conscious contact with a higher power on a daily basis. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm with God 100%. Like he held my hand for the darkest times, man. I was in sleeping next to murderers, you know, and came out untouched. So, um, and then when you're in jail, everyone believes in God, you know, it's, was, <laughs> I mean, uh, there's plenty of, it was, it was all access, you know, religious re- was all access. So there's big Christianity in there. I was, you know, raised Roman Catholic and, you know, just reading the Bible was something I did in big brother. Um, if you ever watched the show, I read the Bible. There's the only thing you can read in there, um, is the Bible. There's no magazines or newspapers or nothing. So, I ended up reading the Bible front to back like three or four times while I was in there. Wow. Yeah. So when I got locked up and got in trouble, it's like when I got out and was partying, like I was telling myself, like, I'm not going to do this shit. You know, when I get out, it's going to be different. The, the minute I got out of the Big Brother house, there was coke and fucking pills. You know, it was a matter of two hours. Right. You know, and I was fucked up again and back. And you know how addiction is. Once you stop and start again, it's even worse. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, I had that three months clean time while I was in the Big Brother house, and I got out, and I was just on fire. You know, plus they're paying me to go everywhere, which is insane. So, tell us a little bit about the the Big Brother. What is that the the Big Brother series? Um, it's on CBS. It's every summer. This was actually when there was a writer's strike. They threw this episode in the winter, but it's usually it's a summer tradition. It's like on season eighteen or nineteen. It's kind of like a Survivor deal where they lock like fifteen strangers in a house, and then each week you vote somebody out. So it's based upon like manipulation and scumbagging people to actually like be the last one left and you win a half a million bucks. Wow. Okay. All right. I got you. It was on national TV, 6 million people, every episode watched the show. So when you get out of the, when you get, but you're locked in there, it's like, there's no contact with the outside world for three. It's like being in jail. Basically, you know, there's no phone calls, no telephones, no nothing. All you see is the people in the house with you. So it's like a strategic mind game to end up being the last one left. Why do they call it Big Brother? I don't know. Because like, they're watching. Like Big Brother's always watching. Ah, I guess it- okay. Now I get it. So here, my 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 first impression of it was like when kids need a bigger brother. Yeah, yeah, what's yeah, that? yeah. What do they call it? Big, big Brother, Big Sisters, whatever that is. It's yeah, always- exactly. So that's what I was thinking that it was. It was something like a positive thing. No, it's a cutthroat reality show. Oh, yeah, hardcore man. And I and, <laughs> and I and I and I never watched it. I just ended up knowing somehow. One person, I actually worked for Donald Trump on The Apprentice, and I met like this casting lady there, and they put me on the show somehow. Just guys got fast tracked. It was just crazy how it all happened. But I never watched it myself, and like I literally, they sequester you in like hotel rooms for like 
a week or two before the show starts because uh-huh. people break. People mentally like can't do it, you know? Got it, got it. So got they'll it. put you in like a hotel room in, in Los Angeles with like a laptop with no internet, you know? And I, so I went and bought every season before mine and watched it in like 1.5 <laughs> fast forward. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so I kind of like brushed up on how it worked, you know, and got the basics down pat. And then I went in there and just kicked fucking ass, dude. I was done. Okay. Easiest money ever made. All right. But when you get out of there, you're locked up for three months. If you last to the end, it's a three-month process. So I ended up being the last one there. When you get out, it's like, boom, it's everyone. It's a whole different life, you know? It's like right. you just won a million dollars, and people have been watching you for the last three months on TV three times a week, you know? So you're kind of in demand for a little while. So I went to a lot of nightclub appearances. They'll pay me to like go to like county fairs and state fairs and all this other crazy shit, man. Like I did a whole like press tour. So like you're getting paid a grand and going to the nightclub and – getting handed fucking vials of drugs you know it's unlimited drinks it's like what are you gonna do so and then and then i was living in florida and that's when the big pill mill was down here right. so they let me out the economy crashed i had a ton of money i started buying real estate and pills that's what i did in my money but a bunch of real estate and a bunch of pills because they had like mobile mri machines here in south florida they were like Literally pull up to your house and do an MRI out front and just fill your script. It's crazy. Wow. That is crazy. <laughs> yes. Holy shit. I'm just trying to imagine this craziness. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. Dude, that is nuts, man. So so real quick, how much clean time do you have? When's your anniversary date? Eight years, October 10th. Nice. Nice. It'll Excellent. be eight years, October 10th again. It's going to be eight years. Dude, it's amazing. It's a fucking miracle. I know. For it's crazy sure. how fast it goes, too. You know, it's like the next thing you know, I'm like, damn. Because when I remember when I first got locked up, I went to get a sponsor and I was like, you know what? I'm going to find the guy with the most clean time that gets pussy that has a nice car. <laughs> you know, that's who I'm going to hang out with. <laughs> that's what I want. That's me. You know what I mean? So I'm going to hang out with that dude. And I'm like, Ralph had 25 years. I'm like, man, if I can get one. And now I got eight. So. <laughs> So I feel like I'm Ralph now. You know what I mean? I got the nice car and I got yeah. a hot girl. So well, good. there you go. There you go. But it's the blessings of sobriety. Without that, I couldn't have it. You know, without being in clear head. And like I never like, – since I was 13, I was never in a clear – I mean just for me, it's just like the clearing of it out. It took like a year or two to fully like detox myself. I was like I swear I had so much opiates in my system. I would still feel them <laughs> like laying in my prison bed. Like my back would still pull at night. Like I'm withdrawing still. It was just insane. Yeah, it is insane. But it's true. And now that I'm in like the whole like recovery and like the business end of things, there's like active detox and passive detox for my fats, my body. You know, like when I would do like strenuous activities or whatever, like afterwards it would release that stuff still. It's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've heard I've heard horror stories about kicking the opiates, man. Like that oxycodone and fentanyl. And, oh. and when you get on the suboxone, oh. you know, like all that shit, it gets it, it just gets nutty. Nuttier and nuttier and nuttier. And it's wiping. Listen, it's wiping people out down here. It's in, in, in Delray Beach in like South Florida and Palm Beach County, man. It's like epic numbers down here. I don't know. It's bad in the country, but like this is like I think where, where I'm at. It's like it's a recovery mecca, and where I don't mean I can't believe there's so much heroin is accessible in a town like this, you know. But where there's addicts, there's going to be drugs, I guess, you know. Yes. And yes. It's just so sad, man. Like it's seriously a problem but i guess i never injected anything i never shot heroin or anything like that so i don't know if i mean not to like gauge how bad someone's addiction is but i think like these kids i see down here on a regular basis that are you know that shoot heroin have a lot harder so i give them a lot of credit man to get sober off of that it seems like that you can really see the struggle on their face you know it certainly does seem like it gets you know the, the the degree of intensity and addiction of these drugs especially the pharmaceutical has, has like gone through the roof like the minute Ugh. you use one you're like you're done you're hooked done then they're saying that like down here they're saying that they're like they're tracing back like where it's coming from it's like meaning china and like the middle east they're like it's like terrorism almost on our country it's wild dude it's wild so you know if you come out of this thing alive you know it's <sighs> it's absolutely a miracle that's for sure And like i said like and it, what happens is they die it's like the hot shot mentality like you don't got it like you used to pal you know what i mean and with that stuff you go back into it and like Sometimes they're better off not getting sober, you know what I mean? Because your tolerance is so high versus cleaning up and then doing it. And then just – I had best story. I mean not best story but the craziest story down here. Um, I was consulting for a, a, a sober home, helping out doing some management over there. And there was these two dudes and two girls. They get two, they got a detox. The one kid was driving that I knew. There's a dude in the passenger seat and two girls in the back. The girl in the back did the heroin. Next girl did it. Both of them died. 
The kid in the front seat did it, died. So my buddy sitting there, the one kind of knew with three dead people in the car with the needle in his arm about to shoot it up, and he didn't do it. Oh, dude. <laughs> That's <is> just crazy. <laughs> Man, I am, oh, what a story that guy's got. Right, but but now you, you go back to asking like what I do every day for my sobriety. Like these are the people, you know, these are the situations, and I'm like helping coach people, kids through, you know. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, if anybody can can walk people through things, it's it's us. You yeah. know what I mean? We've been through it all. Yeah, and sometimes you got to see the reward at the end of the tunnel. You know what I mean? You got it's good to see people who made it. You know, versus sitting there in the same old routine, like what the fuck am I doing? My life this sucks. You know, I'm better off getting high. Yeah. You know, until you see someone that's positive and in a good mood, and it's, it's such a dynamic to it. There's so much to it. Every single person case is different. You know. Yep. On where their path is and how they got there, and whether it's the family, the economics, where they're from, where they're living, the situation, death, trauma. It's just like you know, there's so much to the everybody's equation. But at the end of the day, the simple thing is not using, you know, it's just this one simple thing that everyone has to buy. And that's like my that's like my crutch. You know what I mean? Like I can have all this life. I just can't get fucked up on drugs. There you go. I, I yeah, I that's it. That's the ticket. That's the ticket. There's just the one thing I can do anything else. And uh, I'm OK paying the consequences. But there's one thing where I can't do it anymore, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. You know, can't pay those consequences. I can't go. I can't do cocaine. I, it's not happening. Yeah. You know what I mean, like that's not going to do anything for me. So uh, how old were you the first time you drank or used drugs? Uh, 13, 12, 13. I was, I, was, I, was selling weed at, I was selling weed regularly at 13. I was a drug dealer by 13, 14. That was it. That's all I knew. Already hooked. Hooked. Done. I don't want to pay. I, I, lo- I loved drugs so much. I was not – I was I figured out how to finance it real fast, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, you're killing me. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Adam, I'm just going to let you loose, bro. It's time for me to turn this show over to you. It's time for you to share your story, the battle against drugs and alcohol, the wreckage it caused in your life when you hit rock bottom, and then finally your journey into recovery up until today. So, Adam, take it away, buddy. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's it's, it's a story. It's stories. Everyone got a story. You know, at the end of the day, everyone's pants is different, but, you know, I, I, I go from having nothing to having it all to having nothing to having it all. And you know, the, 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 the catalyst for all that was getting fucked up, you know, it was, it's, it, you know, thinking you're above the law, thinking nothing applies to you. Um, you know, I was never raised with those, those stigmas. Like I never had to want for anything, I guess. My parents weren't filthy rich, but they, I now I wasn't spoiled and they would provide me with everything I needed. My whole life I had it, you know, like the world's yours, kids go get it. And I chose to go out and, you know, sell drugs and party my whole life. And I would have these great business ideas in between and, I will build it up to something great and then it will crash and burn because, you know, what I came to learn out was my mania and my bipolar is which really, you know, swung in such great directions, you know, that the pendulum swung so far, you know, my highs are really high, my lows are really lows. And, you know, since my arrest, I learned how to balance all that out. Right. So my ups and downs are a lot less than they used to be. I used to go from 10 to 10 to zero, 10 to zero. Now I'm staying between like three and five, three and seven all day long. But, I mean, when it comes to, you know, addiction, it's like you can't tell people. It's like it's like sometimes it's like a, it's like a, it's like someone's dating somebody that you know they're cheating on them, and you, no matter how many times you tell them, like, listen, dude, she's cheating on you. Nah, not my girl. It's like you need to stop doing drugs. Who? No one wants to stop getting high. You know what I mean? Like, it's fun. Like getting <laughs> fucked up is fun. You know what I mean? Like, I do. so like the hard time is for the parents out there. Like they just don't get it. You know, it takes that rock bottom. You know, it takes that. You know, acceptance for yourself, like, I can't do this shit no more. You know, um, for me, I was, you know, on my 30th birthday, I got handed a check for half a million bucks. And my 31st birthday, I'm sitting in a fucking prison cell. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. something ain't right. So for me, that awakening was life changing. That was it. That was it. From then on out, I wasn't fucking around no more. I'm not sitting in jail. I'm not doing that routine anymore. Um, so it took my extreme bottom. I had a bunch of bottoms before, a bunch of arrests where I got out of it or conned. And, you know, addicts are the best, you know, they're the most cunning people on earth. They can figure out anything, get money from anywhere, bullshit, lie, or cheat your way through anything. And, um, that's how I lived my life for such a long time. It was just, it was pathetic, you know, in a sense. But, you know, for me, I thought it was the best. I thought it was great at everything I did. I got laid. I had money all the time. I, you know, from one hustle to the next. And then, you know, this time around, I actually earned everything I got. You know, 
started at zero, came out of jail, worked for 250 bucks every two weeks, went to meetings regularly, went to every therapy group I had to go to, attended everything I had to do and just, and put my work in, you know, put in the work. So I deserve what I have now. You know, I earned it. I didn't hustle it or scam it or come up on it fast and easy. You get what I'm saying? I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. So you started as a kid. You were 13 years old. You started smoking weed. Then you started selling it. Nonstop. I was going to Northville. I was collecting money from everyone in high school and going. I would. Yeah, I got my dad on a motorcycle dealership, so they gave me like work study in mm -hmm. high school senior year. So I got out like three periods early. I missed three periods. I got out early. I would collect everyone's lunch money. I would collect all the money in lunch time. I'd go to North Philly, buy the crack, the coke, the heroin, and bring it all back and sell it to everybody by the end of school. So you were okay. So it wasn't just weed. Oh, I was hardcore, man, from the rip. My friend Bob's mom was. She inherited five hundred G's herself in a lawsuit and she blew it all on crack and that was my senior year in high school so she was paying me like five hundred dollars a day to drive her to the crack dealer oh <laughs> oh and you were how old 17 <laughs> dude making just sick money <laughs> in 97 that 95 that was great money man that lasted for about that lasted for about almost a year. Oh wow! Yeah, I think between three and five hundred a day for about a year, just driving this lady to get crack every day. And so at the, and along the way, because here's the deal, she's using. Were you using alongside of yeah, her? Yeah, of course I was. Of course I blew all my Christmas money. I remember shoveling all. I remember shoveling my shoveling snow. My dad would shovel snow with us. I took all the snow shovel money and went and smoked crack Christmas. My mom came pull me out of the crack house. I was eighteen. So what'd you do with all the money? Smoked it, blew oh, it, dude, party, so bought good. casino. What else you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so high school was just easy money, dude. Yeah, easy yeah, money's yeah. fun money. You know what I mean? There was no sense for me since I was eighteen of like the value of a dollar. I never even had it. I never knew it was like to earn anything. It was always a hustle. Yeah, you couldn't have. It was impossible. 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 And everyone wants to get high, dude. Everyone, you know, I'm the great mid I'm the best middleman. I make the middleman the business. I know, you know who has it and who needs it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just made a living off of being a middleman. So how'd you get through high school? I mean, I graduated. I'm smart. I mean, I'm real smart. I had a scholarship to like three different colleges. I lost it all because I missed too many days of senior year of English class. And I still had an A. You know, they made me go to summer school. I finished English senior year. I had an A in the class and missed half of it. I missed half the days. Okay. So they wouldn't pass me because of my attendance. So I lost my scholarships. And then I had to go to Camden County College, pass college there. Started a transportation company in Camden, New Jersey, and that's why I was to get coke from there because I was it was like a front for that shit. And I would take people to the doctor. It was a great business, and then the, they Christie wouldn't pass the law that they wouldn't pay for transportation no more. Then I got a sure house, went took a class in fashion at Burlington County College. Then I went to school in Italy for a private fashion school actually, and then ended up getting locked up in France and in, in 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 French. I went to French prison for selling hash. Dude, yeah, I remember. I was like, I remember you can't. I was for some reason I thought you couldn't X-ray through clay or something. So <laughs> I was at school in <laughs> Italy, and I would go to Amsterdam on the weekend and bring back hash. I remember I mailed the hash home in the pottery, thinking they couldn't X-ray it. And when it got home, I thought like it was like a pound. My brother was like, "There's like three times as much as you thought here." And I'm like, "Oh," and he's like, it's, "It was kilos, not pounds." Oh. <laughs> So it was like payday. So then I was just sending – I did that like three or four times, sending them a few bricks. Of, it, was, it, was, it was fresh Afghani. I remember it was stamped, fresh Afghani hash, bricks of it. I was sent home. And then I went to Amsterdam one time, and there's a train strike in Paris, so I had to take a different route back to get to school. And I was sleeping on the train, and I guess like the douanes, it's called French Customs, were like get up, and they were like – there was weed in like the ashtray on the train, but it wasn't mine. It was weird. And I was sleeping and they were like, get up, get up, American, get up. And I got up and then they saw like I hit it in between the, the, the train seat. They saw a little bit of the plastic and they locked me the fuck up, dude. And I did – I went to trial, the tribunal, and there was a dude in a wig was my lawyer. And it was weird. And he was – I was like, what are you doing, dude? You know what I mean? Like I met the guy before <laughs> and they come showing up in a fucking wig. I'm like, what the hell are you doing, dude? And there's like – <laughs> three people in front of me, like it's like it's not a judge, it's like it's a tribunal. It's like three people decide your fate. And I heard him say something like six, seven months in French. And I swear to God, I don't know what happened. I started talking fucking French, dude. And I <laughs> and I and I, I don't know how I did it. And I negotiated my sentence down to like three months myself. 
Wow. And you spent yep. three months in a French jail? Yeah. What was that like? It was crazy. It was, you know, it was right after 9-11, right? Right. And France colonized Algiers. Like, then, like this Islamic terrorism stuff. Listen, I love everybody. You know what I mean? But France colonized Algiers, and this is a Muslim country. So now, like, generations grew up in France. You know what I mean? Like, it's like my grandfather came from Poland in World War II. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. In America. Like, so France colonized Algiers. Their parents go there, and the children are there. So, like, the prison was, like, 80% Muslim. You know, in France, and it was right after America, and these dudes were like, "Fuck you, America! We love Bin Laden." It was crazy. And meanwhile, he's wearing a Georgetown Hoya sweatshirt and Lakers sweatpants. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? You know what I mean? And my roommate was this crazy Russian militant that got locked up for plastic explosives or something like that, and he was like. You're a good guy. Don't worry. So you have to like go outside and like bump cigarettes, like tobacco. You go promenade, put tobacco. You know, I have to go for a walk after tobacco. So he was he like ended up like beating these Muslim dudes up, and he's like, "Don't fuck with the American no more." And then my job was to weigh bolts out. Like they put together like the BMW and Mercedes visors, but they also sold bolts. Like you know when you go to the hardware store, they sell like packs of nuts and bolts. Uh huh. Yeah. But you have to weigh them. Because that's how they know how many bolts okay. to put in there. Right. And I sold tons of drugs. So I was like, watch this, fellas. And I would just eye up the weight every time. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and then. <laughs> you gotta get, shit's got to get interesting in prison, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, man. It was crazy. And like, they played space, but their cars are different. It was just wild, man. And then I ended up like, they ended up, I know I did like two months in my three months, you know, it's like a good time or whatnot. But like they was it wasn't bad. I mean, I was like twenty two and I was in great shape and stuff. So like no one like fought you or nothing like that. But it was just it was just odd. I was like, oh, the craziest story is the guy I used to get ecstasy pills from. He was he got locked up when I was younger. Like this dude had all his ecstasy. He got arrested over in, in Europe somewhere as Baba or whatever. So I get to this jail and they're like, the last American was here for six years. He just left but the week after I got there. There was an American there for six years. He just left. So I got out of jail. I come to America. I moved to Miami. I met the dude that was in the jail no. before I got there in Miami, dude. How? I just, on the street, I was like, yeah. So I'm friends. He's like, met C Dex. He's like, yeah, I was in Met C Dex <laughs> in jail. <laughs> what are the fucking odds of that? Right. What was he in there for? He's selling ecstasy. For six years he got six for that? Six years. And like I was like 16 and I was like 21 when I got out, whatever. And it was like, that was him, dude. That was – I met the guy that was in jail when I got out. Wow. And then the, the CIA found me on Thanksgiving because they didn't even know where I was. My mom that was missing. You know what I mean? So like on thank my poor mother, dude. It's like she's still she's she's still fucking panics, dude. I'm sure. In the middle of the night, like hey, like it's okay, mom. I'm, I'm not gonna go. Up. It's okay, but she, you know what I mean. I guess after 15 years of I mean 15, I mean what 13 to 30, you know what I mean. Then all the time in jail. So for 20 years, you know what I mean. It was hell for her. No, absolutely, absolutely. And now I, I'm just get, I'm just getting done writing a book now. So I'm about to about to put it out. It's about to. It's a, it's a final edit. It's like I'm getting out of my kids on drugs. Now what? You know, it's just like the be all end all Bible for parents whose kids are on drugs on what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. No. Cause I know now they're like that. Like what kind of insurance you got to get to get them sober to get them. You know what I mean? Like if you know your kids shooting fucking heroin, get on a good insurance policy now. Cause you're going to need it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There's things that you can't, you can't uh, anticipate. Right. So, so this would, this is going to help, you know, especially if you start to suspect that your kid's going in the wrong direction. It's like, oh, I got to make some moves now. Yeah. So it's like about like, like drug testing them, instant drug tests, how to, how to approach them, how to do the intervention, how to pick treatment, what's your role while they're in treatment, what happens in treatment, aftercare, um, you know, IOP, OP treatment, um, meetings, AA, ideas, support groups, coming home when they live back in your house. And then the next book coming out is, I'm getting at a rehab now. What? It's a workbook for kids to start while you're in rehab. It's always like a mess. Like these kids get out of rehab and they're like in a sober home with like on the couch doing nothing because they don't have their social security card to get a job. Like any excuse to do nothing. You know what I mean? Right. So like this book is like, what do you need to bring to a halfway house? Like 
what do you need? Is your, do you have a job? Do you have, where's your license at? Do you have any suspensions? Do you, are you on probation? Who's your probation officer? What sober home do you want to go to? What's a brick a sober home? Like leave your granola bars in your bedroom. You know what I mean? Like don't <laughs> leave your detergent in the laundry room if they're going to use it. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's like the dumbest shit, but like 90% of these kids in treatment down here, it's either you're in jail and you're going to the public way or they're going to go to the private way. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there really is you know, a, a separation of that. Either you're insured and you're your parents and they're going to take care and send you to rehab or you're going to go to a jail. But either way, it still applies. You know what I mean? Like if you're getting out of jail, you're going to go to a halfway house like I did, you know, like a Salvation Army type place. Okay. Or if you're going to get out, if you're going to get out of a, a rehab, they have like sober living homes, you know, transitional living where you stay with a bunch of addicts. Which I believe really helps because, you know, even when you start dating, when you get sober, you know how they say like the 13th step or whatnot, yep. you know, like. But, I mean, in my solid opinion, I see so many kids that live in a halfway house and don't get laid. They sit there and do their program, and then the second they get an apartment, they get a chick, and they're fucking back on drugs. Yeah. They can't handle stuff like that. You need to start courting a girl. You need to start talking to women while you're in that controlled environment so you can say, hey, I have to be home by 11 o'clock. You know what I mean? Like, let's hang out, go to movie, and I'm going to go home. It's not like – because guys get clingy, you know what I mean, or girls get insecure. And it's like you need to start doing that to set yourself up for success. You know, there's a lot of – there's a lot – for me, I figured out how to live, enjoy life, and do things without doing the drugs, you know? Because a lot of people can sit in rehab for 60 days, you know what I mean? Yep. That's the easy part. You got no cell phone, you got no computer, and you told us to do it every day. You got to cook your own meals, you got to go grocery shop, you got to wash your own. Oh, man, this one kid, this one halfway house, man, I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know, I was, I was working for one for a halfway house company for a little while after I got cleaned down here in Florida, and I, was, I, I, I checked the houses, you know? TV's off, the air conditioning sets. They think they think on makes the house cooler instead of auto. First of all, that's insane. Like when your air conditioner, uh huh. Like the auto setting, the on setting doesn't make it cooler, but they think it does. And then I walk in the back, and this kid's sitting there in all black, like ready to go to wait tables, and his and his bare feet. And I'm like listening, and I hear the washing machine running, and I'm like, don't tell me, dude. And he's like, yeah, I need to clean my socks. He had a full <laughs> lo- a full tub of water. With two socks in there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Like, you know, seriously. <laughs> I got no idea. But, like, put it on small. You'll be out of here in 20 minutes faster. But, I mean, like, they just, and you can't get mad because, like, they don't know. Like, mommy and daddy nowadays do everything for everybody. Like, it's just so crazy how it's crazy, man. Like, everyone's under parents' insurance until 26. Like, they like it's encouraging kids to be more dependent on your family. You know what I mean? It's like postponing growing up in a sense. It's weird. So then you got out of prison. You were in France, right? I was in French prison. This is this is back when I'm like 21, 22 right now. This is like 21, 22. I got out of prison in France, came to the USA. I got my degree in fashion design from like the best school in the world. Um, and I told school, this is the lie, I told them, I said I was in France for the weekend and I got in a bar fight and hit a cop on accident. So I lied to them on what happened. That's you know a good what I mean? One. Quick thinking. Right. And that was quick thinking. They're like, oh my God, poor thing. So they graduated me anyway. <laughs> you know? So then I came back to America. I was living in South Beach. I had a girls' clothing company called Girls Who Kiss Girls. It was like some like my club clothing line. I sold a bunch of it. I ended up selling it. I sold the label for like a couple hundred grand oh. and then I went and got a job for The Apprentice for Donald Trump in New York City. I was a task producer on the show. I like created the challenges they all did in the first season of the program, which was a real cool experience. So I actually worked for the president. It's kind of cool, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> I met him. I, I met him like every week. So it's like, it's just cool. Like I know the president. So it's kind of cool. Well, uh, back in the day, is he this? Was he the same asshole that he is today? Listen, I grew up outside of Atlantic City. Okay, so he owned the hotels and casinos. So everyone where I'm from always hated Donald Trump. You know okay, what I mean? Okay, they all yeah. thought he was an asshole. But I ended up working for the guy. Believe it or not, he's not as bad as you think. He, like he portrays me an asshole, but like it, underneath and like it's, it's it's weird. Like he has it has it set up like in the back of Trump Tower is like where he has like all the softball trophies and the jerseys and everything. It does. Like it's like a big softy back there, you know what I mean? And no one sees that. Okay, so there is that side of him that uh, have faith. There is a side in that's okay, <laughs> you know what I mean? I see it, I can vouch for it, <laughs> you know. But like he hides it in the garage, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but he has like every fucking softball trophy from like 1970 in there, you know what I mean? There's like a huge morale. 
even the doorman's happy at that place. You know what I mean? Like the dude was like loving his job. Like everyone that worked there, like loved working there. It was like, it was kind of like cultish almost to a point. You know what I mean? How they much they loved working there. So, I mean, I went in there hating the guy, you know what I mean? Then I actually seen how he operates and seen behind the scenes a little bit. So I'm, I, it's not that I love the guy, but it's, 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 he's not as, don't worry. There's, there's, it's not all lost. And that's been my personal experience. You know what I mean? I've seen it firsthand, so I know he's a mushy guy behind the asshole. <laughs> but like he, he, but he, but he, he, he sets his set up. He sets it up so no one sees it. You know what I mean? It's strange. And like I just like like no one even goes in the garage. And he, I, I, I go everywhere. I just, I'm, I, I'm almost a nosy person. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm just walking where I'm not supposed to walk at because I work in the building. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. And I saw all this stuff in every trophy and the big display cases and stuff in there. And so it's like there's a sense of like camaraderie, you know what I mean, in there, which is kind of good, I guess. But eh, this is just a fucking mess with this whole thing going on. And then I live in Palm Beach County now. So uh, there's like – he comes here every weekend. You know what I mean? I, li- I, li- I live four miles from his Mar-a-Lago house. Now, have you seen him since he got elected? Yeah, I, mean, I haven't seen him. I've seen the motorcade. Okay, yeah, you I can't see, get the, close the, enough. I mean, I'm sure. No, you can't get dude, they closed this no, place yeah. down over yeah, here, man. Yeah, it's yeah, insane. Yeah. So it's like, and now it's really a, like they they closed everything down. It was a mess for a while. I'm sure. I mean, just the traffic and everything got all jammed up, and people down here are like disgruntled about it. But you know what I mean? It, it, it is his life. You know, you can't have everything you want every day. Right, 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 right. So then, okay, so then from there, right from the so you were on the, you were actually on The Apprentice. I was a task producer for the show. Like, if you look at the credits at the end, I actually sat in the chairs. They tested the lights on me. We, I, 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 was, I did all the challenges. I created them and, and tested them out before the actual contestants did the challenges. Okay. I was part of what's called the Dream Team. It's kind of a cool job, man. Yeah, no, I, I can, all, I can uh, only imagine. You've had so many amazing opportunities. Yeah, okay, that you and I that, fucked that. I yeah. fucked that one up too. Some dude. <laughs> so listen to this one. Some dude sends me an AOL instant message. You want weed? I said sure, and I gave him my address. Dude sent me thirty pounds of weed in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, was that <laughs> another? God. And was it that came a, three times? The third one I got locked up. In the third okay, box. I was about to say. Okay, well, did you get busted? Yes. <laughs> one came through. Was okay. The next one came through. Was okay. Third box. Listen how crazy. You know, there's always something crazy. There's an anthrax scare, and like DHL searched all the boxes and found it. That's how I got caught. They told oh, me. dude, it's like, who would have anticipated that? Right. <laughs> but who on AOL? Like, who says yes? Send me weed. I don't. know. I'm an idiot. Oh, dude, you, I, you'd be surprised. Like, I got an AOL instant message. Like, bang, you want some weed? I said, sure. Sure. Why not? You know, you're like, <laughs> wow, I just won the lottery. A fucking computer box came in fucking packed, dude. It was insane. That is crazy. So then how, yep. did, how did this whole brothers thing come into play? How the big you- brothers. So so then while I was in New York, there was a Tommy Hilfiger show called The Cut that I that I, they casted me for. And I thought it was too crazy for the rest of the, you know, the contestants. So they filmed it and it was a flop. And the lady who owned the casting company like went to bat for me. And apparently she kept my picture on her desk for like – four years and she's like i'm gonna make you famous and then she just called my cell phone and then i was in philadelphia for a while and then i moved to delray beach and i was in the florida i was here for like three four months and then my phone just rang an unknown number and it's like they're like hey jasinski what's up you want to be on tv i said sure i said what do i gotta do so they're like, get to tampa next weekend and you were gonna be a big bros with the tampa i did the interview there i knew the people from before um i did the casting and then they flew me to California. I did the casting out there, and I guess they liked me. So then I guess the whole way – listen, how crazy this story is. I guess the way the show works is they surprise you with like a key to the Big Brother house. So like they're like, yeah, you know, you're you're an extra, you know, you're 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 one of the substitutes, you know, we're gonna come, you know, do some B roll footage with you. They're like, you know, just in case, pack your bags, but you know, it's probably we're not gonna show for gonna come or not. So I was like, okay, whatever. I didn't make it, you know. Right, right, right. So I packed the bag anyway. They flew in. They take me to the bowling alley, and they're like, surprise, here's the key. And I'm like, fuck. And they're like, come on, let's go. Give us your cell phone. I was like, give me one minute. And I call my buddy. I was like, yo, buddy, come here. I started handing him all the drugs out of my pocket. I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Holy I cow. Was, I was loaded down, dude. I had all kinds of weed and pills and shit on me. I was like, here, take it, buddy. So they took me and then like I kind of withdrew on TV for a little while, you know what I mean? 
Oh, that's wild. So, okay. Because yep. I, was, I was taking pain pills. So I had like a script with me and I ran out when I was like in the house and they found it and they took it. And then I went through withdrawal on TV for like oh, three days and then it wasn't that bad. And then I was okay. And that's when I was like, right, I got three months sober. You know what I mean? I ended up winning 500 fucking grand somehow, some way. And I come out and the, the economy is tanked. I bought a bunch of houses, man. But it was great. The con- Everyone else is broke and I got 500 Gs. You know what I mean? So what the, was this 2009, right? Yep. Why would you buy pro- – well, no. At that point, it already tanked. So then tanked. everything – I, I, I bought – I bought – I got four unit, four unit house, four unit property, quad plus for 70 Gs. I got a four bedroom house for twenty five grand at an auction. Oh wow! I, yeah, I, I cleaned up. You so actually made the, some smart moves. Yeah, that's when I got loaded a jail. I like a, a I, freight train. I, yeah, I got a jail. Now they're all worth a bunch of money. So I ended up, I ended up on the other, on the better end of the stick, I guess. You know what I mean? But my mom, my mom's in real estate. She's like, listen, I know you're getting fucked up. She's like, I'm taking, take that money and you're gonna buy houses. Nice. Yeah. So that was the best thing I did. I ended up coming out owning three houses outright. You know. I got out of jail, so I, I kind of had a little jump start. But still, you know what I mean? They were in disarray. I left, you know, you get fucked up and, and it all hits rock bottom. I left a lot of my parents' plate, you know, a lot of loved ones I hurt. You know, my girl went now. She was with me before I even started. She stuck by me and it's just, you know, I put you, you put everyone through a lot of shit, yeah, you know? Yeah, totally, totally. So so leading up to that, so here it is. You get the you get the 500 Gs. You start buying properties. You start buying drugs. Tons right? of pills, dude. Tons, Tons of, of pills. pills. Tons. You're, you're, you're dealing so yes. how was the bust? Oh, man. I was flying all over the fucking country, dude, selling pills all over. The TSA, they all knew me from Big Brother, dude. It was like free pass. You know what I mean? Yep. It was crazy. Uh-huh. So then the dude actually called me. It's fucked up, dude. They, like, they don't play like – oh, I guess I, I never watched or looked much, but I guess from like what they said, like the audio tapes, whatever they had, like they don't play the parts where they're like fucking begging you. So it was like a total fucking scumbag setup, dude, like – they bought me a ticket to come up, and I was like, no, dude, I can't come. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm like, no, I'm not coming. I missed the flight. I didn't want to do it. And then you know, the dude was like, my girl's in the hospital. My, da- my dad's in the hospital. I can't get my car or the shop. I knew this kid for like 10 years. You know what I mean? Right. He's like a buddy of mine. As he's like, you know, my car's in the shop. My girl can't get a Halloween costume. He's like, blah, blah, blah buy you a ticket now. I was like, no. And like the cops like bought me a ticket to fly up there. But to me, it was only like – I mean there was only a couple scripts. You know what I mean? Like they're giving you two, three hundred at a clip down here. Correct. So like your sense of – you know what I mean? Like for me, that's only two prescriptions, what I brought up there. You know what I'm saying? Three prescriptions. But to them, it's fucking eight years <laughs> in jail. It's all about perspective, man. <laughs> yeah, it is. Like when you're sitting there with fucking piles of them. Yep. Scripts all day. It's like, oh, I'm good. And then you get there and you're like, holy shit. So they use one of your buddies – yeah. To, okay. Well, that wasn't considered entrapment. He, well, I guess he, got, I guess he got jammed up somehow. You know what I mean? And then he told on me, and he, and then I guess to get himself out of trouble, he set me up. Right. Got it. And the got and the code it. word was like, I need an eight ball. So I got off the airplane, I guess, and I was in the car with them, and it was like he called. He's like, he able to call my buddy and get some coke. I was like, okay, cool. And he's like, yeah, I need an eight ball. And I was like, that's fucking weird. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And then he pulls in a CVS parking lot and like all these three agencies run down on you. And I didn't know one's putting your hands up. One's your hands behind your back. One's going on the ground. I'm like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> you know what I mean? And they all started fucking jumping on me. Fuck my neck up. It was a mess. It's a mess, dude. It was, it was a mess. And I was up for four days on coke. I was a mess. I was up for, I was a train wreck, dude. People in the airport were staring at me like I had three heads. It was embarrassing. It was horrible. Yeah, I can only imagine the insanity. Oh, of that. I, sl- I slept good, dude. I slept for like four days, dude. Straight, like I'm done. So they got you, right? Got me. Okay, got you. And then they t- they haul you to jail, right? So how long did yep. you actually spend in jail? I was in jail for three months, and then they I finally petitioned the court to let me go to a rehab in Massachusetts. Now, mind you, they locked me up. I live in Florida. They locked me up in Massachusetts. Yeah, what's up with that? Right. They flew me up there, so I had to go to court. I was in jail in Massachusetts. I had to go to court in Massachusetts. They sent me to a rehab, like an inpatient, like, like. do you ever hear a TC, a therapeutic community is? No. Oh, my God. It's fucking insane, dude. It's like you have to pull each other up and tell on everybody. It's, a, it's, 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 it's insane. But it got me sober. You know what I mean? It taught me about Alcoholics Anonymous and talking about it. And Narcotics Anonymous and the program and the steps and all that great stuff that saved me, you know? Right. Those principles, it's something to live by. It's, it's great information. Everyone should learn that stuff. You know, everyone should know those principles and ways to live your life because it works. So 
they put me in Spectrum RP for six months. I do the program. So now I did three months in jail. They said, if you complete this treatment program, we'll let you go, you know, to your parents' house of Philadelphia and like address your mental illness and, you know, get your affairs together before sentencing. So I was in, I did six months there and then they, then they gave me release. So I, then I went to, I did out an I intensive outpatient program in New Jersey, in my parents' house. They let, they let, they let me stay. They put me on house arrest, um, in New Jersey at my parents. So I stayed there. My girl came from Florida, stayed up there with me. Um, and was sick to my stomach every day. Cause knowing I'm eventually going to go to jail. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, it was terrible. It was fucking torture, man. It was bad. So I went to the outpatient program. And then I was like, something's not right. You know what I mean? And my lawyer had me talk to like a forensic psychiatrist and he was like, you, I think you're bipolar. And I was like, okay. So I went online. I was like bipolar studies, Philadelphia. So I Googled it, went to university of Pennsylvania, one of the best schools in the world. And they had this study for people who cycle like manically, like, and it was like for like who cycle once a year. And I, I go to the guy and he was like, man, he was like, you don't qualify, but you've been suffering for long too much. I'm going to get you better. Where his exact words. And like this dude, like they did the medication program I went on. It took, I did it for like four years, four and a half years of following a program with that. And it saved my life, man. It was completely opened my life up to like, wow, I, this is what life is now. That is amazing because yep. I'll tell you, man, what leads up to it and all the anxiety and all the fear and then getting into prison and then, you know, what's going to happen to me and how much time I'm going to be in here that, you know, getting out, you know, from. No, from, then they let me out. And then I went to I went to University of Pennsylvania, find that I was I was bipolar. Then they sentenced me. Then in January, I went back to sentencing to, to plea bargain. They locked me up right there and then for four years. Sentence. So then I went back in the jail. So I got out on bond sentence, and then I went to got then I went to UPenn, came to my parents' house, got my medication, finally got my mental health address, and then they said, "You're pleading guilty. You're going to jail right now." So they put me in jail to wait sentencing. So they were trying to give me eight years. So somehow. Because I was still on probation from the thing in New York, and then right. my mom got a letter from them. My mom did all this crazy work. My mur- my girl did all this crazy work, and then ended up getting me, you know, a four year sentence. But I already served a few months, you know, of that already. So I ended up having like three years left. I was in Boston. Then they transfer you. Now the way the feds work as federal charges, they designate you to some random prison. It's so crazy how the system works. So I was in Massachusetts. They transfer me. So my destination prison was Morgantown, West Virginia. This is like the club fed. Like Barbara Walters, like I guess it was on TV. They put me in this club fed place, and it was all like the guys from Wolf of Wall Street were there. It was all like <gasps> no centers. way. Yeah, dude, I'm Get telling you, out. I, was, I was with some real fucking pros, dude. And <laughs> so the okay. way you get there is they fly. I, I, I go from oh, love this great story. I was in MDC, Brooklyn. I was in. It was in. Massachusetts, and I go. They 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 bust me to Brooklyn, MDC, Brooklyn, Metropolitan Detention Center, Brooklyn, on Univision. This is the craziest story. On Univision, like I have like a Google search for my name, and anything comes up, like mm-hmm. a daily update. Yep. And then I got one like two weeks ago or three, like a month ago from Univision. It's a story about El Chapo, how he's in MDC, Brooklyn, and uh-huh. it's all in Spanish. And my name is in there with El Chapo. Is like famous. Re- Famous people who were in this jail. Oh, wow. So it's like El Chapo, and then it says me. It's crazy. <laughs> so, so I guess I made it when I'm in an article with El Chapo. You know what I mean? Oh, my God. That is wild. Yep. So, so in other words, uh, can we can we really say you did hard time? I did hard fucking time, man. It was bad. They put me on con air. So then they fly you from – I to get to West Virginia, I had to go to Oklahoma City. So they put you on an airplane, just like the movies, man. There's a dude in a mask and everything on there. It was insane. Dude. So they put you on a, they put you on an airplane. They fly you to Oklahoma. The air, the jail is on the runway. So the airplane pulls up. You walk off the airplane into a jail. Oh wow! Then they transfer you there, and they flew me to Pittsburgh, and I took a bus to West Virginia. So then I was in West Virginia and did my whole sentence there. In there, I did what's called the RDAP program. It's a, it's like a 500 hour drug abuse program. Hardcore, dude. And like, so basically the whole time I was gone for four years, my job was treatment. You know, my right. job was meetings, sobriety, 
like beat it into me. Like I conditioned myself over that time to live the right way, you know? So when they finally released me to the Salvation Army for like in Florida, I took a bus to Florida. And it was so crazy, man. I didn't smoke a cigarette now for four years. The second I got off that bus and was free, I reached to my pocket for a cigarette, like knowing it wasn't there. Ooh. You know what I mean? Like that's yep. how ingrained that, 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 like, that habit is. So like, and it was, it was, and I had that sensation for a while. And then after I, after you eat at the Salvation Army, everyone would go outside and smoke cigarettes. So I like made a, not a, like, a, like, like a decision to just go upstairs and read my book, you know? So I was like, when I'm done eating, I'm going to go read my book. So the hardest part wasn't the drugs. The hardest part for me was not smoking, believe it or not. I know. I believe it. Dude, I have talked to more people that say quitting the cigarettes was by far the toughest thing I had to kick. Yep. Because, you know, mentally it fucks with you, you know, because it's like, well, it's not really a, like a drug drug. It's not right. a narcotic, you know, yep. and it kind of like I can I can take care of this later. Right. Yep. So so you can. But just... that was the promise I made myself the day I got to sentencing and got put back. I smoked a Marlboro 100 out front. I'm like, this is my last cigarette I'm ever going to have. You know what I mean? So for me, that was the, I never promised myself the drugs. I never promised nothing else. The promise I made me. You know, I was like, oh, I'm not smoking another fucking cigarette. I'm so going to live by my time back because cigarettes will kill me. You know, yep. so go figure. The one thing I promised was the hardest thing to deal with, of course. So I just never smoked a cigarette after that. Never again. That's done with crazy. Cigarettes. Thank God. Yep. And then, but, but then my mom quit and like, oh, she was like, oh, they smell so gross. And I'll be <laughs> like, well, you used to smoke. I was like, gross. Now I know where she's <laughs> coming from. Now I think cigarette smoke is disgusting. Yes. Yeah. Well, you're fortunate. You're fortunate that now that, that that is part of your your, your makeup, like the genetic makeup is like you smell it and it's like, oh, it's disgusting. Yep. Done with that. Better than if you're outside and people are smoking and like, oh, wow. Oh, right, so, right. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah seriously. Right. seriously Give that's me one a, of them. I call it a spiritual awakening, right? Like, ah, oh, man, look, I hate this shit now. Yeah, versus like, give me one of them. Like, I wish I could have a cigarette. So there's no cravings. And then like with the drugs and stuff like that, it's just like, you know, you try and be normal and stuff. You just have to like, it's for me, it's like just I drive myself everywhere I go. You know what I mean? I never get stuck in a situation I don't want to be in. Right. You know, because I mean, you can't, I mean, it's hard. Some people like try and isolate themselves from everything. Like, you know, life goes on. Like for me, there's life after drugs. You know what I mean? Like the conversations in my day, like I see these kids every day at the treatment center. It's not like I don't even talk about drugs with them. You know, I talk about like jobs and girls and fun and what are you doing with yourself, you know? Absolutely. Like at some point in your life, it has to move. Past. For me, I think it's imperative to move past the drugs, you know, to fully recover. Well, of you know, course. you have to be. I mean, if you're still everyday drugs or drugs or drugs or alcohol, 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 you're still, you know, conditioning your mind to be involved with yeah that. if you're romancing it if you haven't found a way to to walk away detach yourself from the romance of it all it, yep. it really means you haven't worked the program yep exactly you know exactly. You, you white knuckled it for a while you got off the shit and then all of a sudden you're like yeah i remember that and then and anytime there's a little bump in the road your first yep. thought is you know th this how will much help. easier would it be yep 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 now listen here's the thing i was googling you Right. Yeah. And I found this this horrible picture with you and Matthew McDonald. Oh, my God. So, you know, so so this is stuff that in the midst of it all you're dealing with because you're you're this this figure, you're this public figure. And, you know, like everybody's like, wow, this is amazing. You know, just like everything else, you know, when, when you're on top. Right. You know, everybody's the doors all open. Yeah. Then you hit, you know, you, you hit, uh, you know, a moment like this. So you and Matthew were the guys that were distributing. Is that what it was? Were you guys? Yeah, he, I was hooking him up too. You know what I mean? He was. He was. He, uh, he had to make money too. Okay, so he was. He was also. It says here. It's this is horrible. More legal troubles for douchebag Big Brother contestant. <laughs> it's horrible. It's fucked up. I love it, dude. Dude, you got to. Now you have to laugh at it. You have it's to. It's the you know? best. Because it's been well, like, fucking listen, eight years. It's not years. like I'm calling you talking on the radio now like, hey, I'm at a jail with me now. You know what you're, I mean? Like, of course. My life has substance now. Like, I, I help hundreds of people a year. Yeah, no. You're part you, – you've, you've recovered, right? Yep. But in the Great. midst of it all, this these articles come out like – that's got to just weigh on you like a ton of – Yeah, well, they stopped coming. You know what I mean? When I got out of jail, I seen them all, and they kind of was dead by then. You know, it was four years later. So now, like, I did the thing with the Philly Voice. I did an article, Entertainment Weekly. I just did – they, they, they're doing a piece on me in April. 
you know, so it's starting to catch track. You know, I'm doing the right thing now. So all that should have got pushed away. But it was tough seeing all that. It was a big pull to swallow. Yeah, I, I'm looking at some of this stuff and it's like, that's the problem. Cause we've all been fucking fucktards and morons, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what we do. We, we destroy our lives. We leave this massive wreckage. We hurt our family. You know, we end up in jail. But you know, when you're a public figure, then people just love to get on oh, the bandwagon. They, they sell oh. you out, man. I got, listen. Oh, fucking hey, dude. People rob, pillage, everything. And forget, I mean, especially when you get locked up, dude. All your shit's gone. <laughs> no one cares about nothing. I came out, no. my car was all smashed up. You know what oh. I mean? Like, fucking great. You know, I go on the GPS in my car and it's like New York City. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Like, what the fuck is in New York in my car? So then, yeah. So then, so then you get out of jail, right? And you've been doing, at this point, you've been eating, breathing, sleeping, recovery. Going to yep. meetings, reading, reading the Bible, reading recovery yep. literature. So it's become this, you know, you use that time to the benefit. Dude, to I your- got out of jail and I bought houses in the rehab capital of the country, man. Delray Beach, fucking Mecca for rehab. I started buying properties. I started working with sober livings. I started getting into the business. I was consulting for different companies. And, Excellent. You know, I actually started working at a call center. You know what I mean? While I was on house arrest, and it was a it was a long road to get there. You know what I mean? Of course. And it was it was very awkward. I was very scared. I was nervous. I was afraid to go out. I was afraid to even go in public. I was just nervous. I wasn't want to get high. I was nervous to talk to the wrong people. You know? So I just. They put you on house arrest for six months. So it was really like I just worked and went to meetings and did my thing, you know, so it kind of got me acclimated. But after you get free for a while, you know what I mean? You're left to your own vices. So I really started like, you know, working with people who own halfway houses and like working. I worked at a halfway house. I worked for a big sober living company for like a year. You know what I mean? Really? Yeah, I had a great position. I was like, I was like, I was like one of the executives for a big, huge sober living company. I owned like hundreds of beds, you know, and. I did great with them. I learned the business. I learned the industry. I learned about the recovery business. And then I started doing consulting for other companies. And, you know, and eventually got to the point where my mom was like, hey, look, you know, you know so much. And her her good friend daughter died of a heroin overdose, but um, ended up being, I know. So they were like, hey, let's do something here. So I saw down here there was only like there's 300 rehabs in Palm Beach County, but there's only two mental health centers, you know. And the problem is people ship them down here for rehab. They get cleaned out and they get sober like me and they're like, hey, it's not the drugs aren't my problem. There's other things. So if you can picture it like this, if you're – there's like – there's different tracks. You know, Like if you're you know, hearing voices in your head and you're in a group and a bunch of people do heroin, you're not going to talk about your voices because they're going to make fun of you when you get to the housing. You know what I mean? Right. But if you're in a bunch of people with like, hey, his voice is way worse than my voice. You know what I mean? I can uh-huh. talk about it. Right. So right. – I mean, that's what I'm doing today. And it took me about, you know, about a good four, four or five years after jail, you know, to get to this point where I'm really, you know, doing my thing now. I'm starting to do some speaking. Got this book I'm finished up on. My mom is this treatment center, you know, and I, you know, consult a lot, a lot of different companies, you know what I mean? On their business model, just for me, but from my experience, what I know. And it's like the reintegration part of it, like from prison, like I went to like this big conference with the breakers, and like the world's premier guy was talking about it. And like, they're clueless because they didn't do it. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of hard, you know what I mean? To practice in theory sometimes. Yes, of course. You know, especially recovery, you know, you got to go through it like an addict helps an addict because you've been through it. You know what I mean? It's kind of. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's kind of difficult sometimes for someone to tell you, you know, like this is what we got to do to reintegrate people better. You know, to make your life your at your transition better. So my mission kind of is like, once you get out of rehab, I want to show you people how to live successfully. You know what I mean? Yes. That's what my mission is. And that's what you're. So you're currently involved right now in the mental health aspect. Yeah, it, 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 it's substance abuse and mental health, but okay. it's mainly focused on mental health. It's 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 it's, it's a full, Ocean's Medical Center is a fully licensed drug rehab, IOP, OP, inpatient rehab, everything level of care. Um, But the speciality of it is like some have trauma programs, you know, some have substance abuse with, you know what I mean? This is like a substance abuse program that focuses on the mental health part. So there's two separate programs in the program. One's just for substance abuse. Like if you just do drugs, you can come great, get treated. But the real specialty of my passion is the mental health and the things because, you know, once I learned how to manage my mania, the drugs fell by the wayside pretty much, you know, but everyone's different. So there's, there's, there's part of demographics like, Hey, you know what I mean? Like, I'm an addict. That's what my problem is, the drugs. You know, for me, the problem is I was substituting the drugs just to, you know, try and stable myself. 
Correct. Correct. So then this is this is something that you and your mom own together. Uh, no, I, she, she's the owner. I don't she's own any of it. Yeah, I'm not. I don't, I don't own. I don't own. I just I just help consult over there and you know do my thing as I can. You know, she's the one that owns it and so her, you and her work partner for your mom. Thing. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I, I help her out as much as I can. I mean, I work for myself. I have the real estate thing that I do. And so you're you know, still this, doing the real estate speak. thing. Yeah, I'm always buying houses, man. Buying them, fixing them. Okay, all right. So that's still that's still a lucrative business over there. Yeah, that's good to go. Okay. All right. And that and, I, I, and that pays the bills. You know what I mean. I own enough property that I can pay my bills. So I'm not really, I'm not trying to do any quick. You know what I mean. For me, if when it comes, it's all about money and money's first. It tends to, you know, my whole life tends to like get fucked up. So I just need to keep that in perspective. You know what I mean. I just got to be satisfied with what I have, live in my means. You know, take it easy every day, and that's it. So if our listeners are listening right now and they want more information about uh, oceans. Uh, OceansMedicalCenters.com. Okay. That's the that's the website, Ocean Medicals. Oceans with a S. Oceans Medical Centers with an S dot com. If you Google it, I got it, I got I got it, I got it ranking pretty good. There's another the other only other Oceans Medical is a hospital in New Jersey. And like I'm good at marketing and stuff like that. So when I start like doing like the, the web presence now, like when you type in Oceans Medical, it'll come at a place in New Jersey. Now when you type Oceans Medical, we we got them beat. It's pretty it's pretty interesting watching it happen. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right, so then uh, they can just. I'll have that. Uh, I'll have that listed on the. Yeah, show listen. Notes if anybody listening, dude, anybody needs to talk to somebody, needs help with anything. Well, I'm a talker. You know what I mean? It's what I do. I talk. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> if anybody wants to reach out, say hi, get a hold of me. You know, my my website's adamjusinski.org, but I'm still working on that. But if you want to get me on, or whatever, anyway, you know, email me adamjusinski2 at gmail dot com. Whatever you want, say hi. I mean, especially for parents out there, my thing is like i said before addicts are, do, addicts are doing drugs they like doing drugs you know what i mean so it's more the mom at the kitchen table staring in the space like what the fuck am i gonna do right like help me you know i i'm like that age where i'm in a sweet spot where if you're like 20 22 23 i can still you know i'm not to say the word hip or anything but i'm like you know i know the routine i know what's up you know so i have a better shot you know sometimes i talking to your child or Sometimes that third party to talk to your child for the intervention makes it a whole – You know, I know if I was in a room with my mom, my dad, and my brother, and they're like, you're going to rehab, I'd be like, go fuck yourself. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like if there's a dude like me in the room, it's a whole different tone. That's you understand? True. Yeah, 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 yeah. So – but the real thing for me is going to be the book. As soon as it comes out, I'm going to call you, man. Get me back on here. OK. Absolutely. It's going to be big, man. It's going to be a real game changer I think because there's nothing like the book out there. To really be of a viable resource, and I share a lot of my tips in there. What, what's good for me, how I'm successful, what I do every day, and like it, it, it's, it's real. I bought. I'm so obsessive sometimes. I bought every single book on Amazon about addiction. <laughs> Read every fucking book, dude. And like, I got them all beat. I, I took all the good stuff and added my stuff in there. This is gonna be like the go-to comprehensive guide if your kid's on drugs. What you need to do, step by step by step. Well, like it doesn't set you up. Like even like the part of like. Don't buy extra razor blades because I'm going to return them to the fucking store. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> how to live. <laughs> ABCs on how to live. <laughs> I'm selling them all out, dude. Oh, I got parents here, man. They're, they ain't going to get nothing past them no more, man. I love it. Because you're naive. You don't realize that like the razor blades are worth $12. And that's going to get you fucked up. So then your, your actual website, you're building it. It's adamjasinski.org. Adamjasinski.org. Another guy, the day, the, listen to this crazy how my fucking shit story is. The day before I go to buy my adamjasinski.com, someone bought it. The day before I bought it. Really? Yeah, I'm just, another adamjasinski.com. Oh, another, what are the odds? <laughs> like the day after I went to buy the domain, it was gone. I was like, what the fuck? You Dude. know, but so I'm, I'm dot org. <laughs> it's okay. I'm Oceans Medical on Facebook. Hashtag Oceans Medical on Social media. Excellent. Excellent. And we post a lot of good, helpful stuff. You know what I mean? It's the same routine with that shit. You know what I mean? I keep active. You know, I share what I think is cool. I have a you know, good team of people and, and, and my, my mom and they, with the help of me, you know, put together something really special, you know? Absolutely. I mean, I'm a quick, I'm a quick faith of felon, so I can't own anything. You know what I mean? So that's where it comes down to it. So it's, it's the fact that I need to focus on myself. And I think if I had a business like that, I wouldn't be able to do, you know what I mean? I'm not ready for that pressure. Right. Right, right, right. But that's that's all part of it. It's, it's all, you know, recovery affords you the opportunity 
to see exactly where you are at face value, right? Yep. Brace who you are, accept who you are, and then do whatever workarounds you need based on the consequences. Yep. I'm aware of being aware. Like my therapist says, I, I, I still go to therapy. I listen. I can go to therapists once a month now. You know what I mean. And I can go for three months, and there's nothing to fucking talk about in that one month. And when I dish on him, you know what I mean. <laughs> right. it, it's worth its weight in gold. Right. But he taught me you got to be aware of being aware. I got to see. I have to see how I start feeling. I can feel I'm starting to get depressed. I can see where I'm getting too manic and excited. You know, mm-hmm. and you rein it in a little bit. So I'm aware that look, look, I can't take on a huge business like that myself. I'm not. And you know what I mean. If I can't. I'm not at that level yet where I'm ready to take something on where it's all encompassing like I was before where I would crash and burn. So I know my limits. You know, I know what will work. I know what won't work, you know? Absolutely. And the big payday, the big cash in, the big get rich quick, that shit don't work. You Never does. I mean? You got to you take your time. You put your work in day after day after day after day and then eventually you're going to see results. A hundred percent. All right. Excellent. Okay, Adam, we're going to start winding down, buddy. You ready? All right. Yeah, I'm good. Excellent. What a story, dude. Seriously. Good time. I did all right for you. Wow. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> just wow. I knew it was gonna be a roller coaster ride. <laughs> it's just crazy, dude. I uh, can't wait for the book. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna it's, it's gonna be good. And I put I put a lot of like like it's not like a lot of the self help books out there are just like this is what you need to do. Like I put like I put myself out there, like I put some good funny stories in there about like my life and my experience. Like I did everything that happened in there. Like my mom used to work for like for LabCorp. She was like the vice president of LabCorp. So before they had home piss test, she would maybe paint a plastic cup and like bring it to work with cellophane on top of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and I was on heroin and crack and there was pee in the toilet bowl and I dipped the, the cup in there. You know what I mean? And it came back positive for TAC. My dad was smoking weed, I guess. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. <laughs> no. <laughs> We are crafty, dude. It still backfired. Yeah, <laughs> but it was better than crack, yeah, though. You know, I, I, I share all the good stuff in the book. You know, it's it's, it's really it's it's it, it makes it. Make, I mean, you know, I, I want to be the parents. You know, I want to be that that superhero to the parent. You know, I want to be available, accessible. You know, now at Ocean's Medical, there's a team of professionals over there that can help. You know what I mean? If any right. mom at home who's alone, who feels like there's no one to talk to, like call Ocean's. You know what I mean? Yep. Call them. There's someone there that's going to help you. There's someone to talk you through it. There's a voice in the phone that you're not alone. You know, whether they come get help here or not, you know, it's still having someone to help you coach you through the process, giving you tips, giving you pointers. Like, parents are not alone out there. All right, so here we go. All right, so I'm going to ask you five questions about your early recovery, and I want you to respond with inspiring and insightful answers you can share with our newcomers. Are you ready? You got it. Let's do this. Number one. What was keeping you from getting clean or staying clean when you first got introduced to recovery? What was keeping me clean? I mean, when I got first, my story is different. I first got introduced to recovery. I was under the, facing eight years in prison, so there was never that. There wasn't much option for me. So I'm 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 a one and done guy. <laughs> okay, question answered. All right. So then, number two, at what point did you have a spiritual awakening? That aha moment in recovery when you accepted that you were powerless over drugs and alcohol, but for the first time had developed the hope that you could recover? Uh, when I realized that God was tied into the whole picture, you know, when I feel the higher power type thing was really was my aha moment. Like for me, the aha moment was the, the steps and the higher power thing. Like you got to surrender and give it up. Yeah. You know, when I, when I found that I wasn't in control, when I stopped making my own decisions, when I, like it's not all on me. That was my aha moment. Let, let let go and let God. You know what I mean? I Take the wheel, dude. Absolutely. Get out of the way. Yeah. Get out of the driver's seat. I love it. That's it. And like to, even if, when I'm all stressed out, I just take a breath. I'm like, God, it's up to you. It's okay. <laughs> Deep breath. Take this fucking shit and do something with it because I'm tired of dealing with it. You yeah. know what I mean? And it works. It, it works. It works. It's not like I'm doing – I want to keep doing what I'm doing if it didn't work. And that is the truth. For those of us who have managed to have long-term sobriety and clean time, it, it it's because it works. Our lives yeah. changed innumerably or we wouldn't be doing it, period. Exactly. No, I get you. I get you. All right. So next question. If you could give our newcomers only one suggestion, the other one's already taken, what would that be? Speak up. It's a selfish program. It's all about you. If you want to do it, speak up. Open your mouth. Don't shut up. Talk, 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 talk. There's, there's, a, there's magic in the spoken word. What goes on in your head doesn't make sense until you speak it. Oh, man. Beautiful. 
absolutely beautiful. You got to be able to open up and share. Once you say what you're thinking, it's some magic of the spoken word. Either the universe makes it happen, or you realize how stupid your your thoughts have been. Like you can be tormenting yourself for weeks over something you talk about, it, and it's like, what was I thinking? Open your mouth. That's it. Absolutely. All right. Perfect. Like for me, I'll talk. I don't care if even <laughs> no one pays attention here or knows what I'm saying. I'm talking for myself. You know what I mean? To the point where I'm speaking, so I'm clearing my thoughts. Yep, absolutely. That's exactly how it is. Until you get that poison out of your head, it will kill you. Yeah, and the only way out is by talking it, yep. writing it down, or talking. I mind speaking, speak it. Yep, pen and speak tongue. Speak out of your head. Pen is and it? tongue. Is it? Yeah. Put it down. Put it down. Lay it down. Adam, awesome, bro. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, for sure, man. Thank you. This is great. This is great. Fun. Lots got my of girl out there in the other room. She had no idea. No, she wanted to watch a movie. She wanted to watch a movie and chill. And I'm like, oh, I got a podcast. Got to go. <laughs> oh man, I love it. I'm Fo- coming, baby. I'm worried. All right, folks. We've now reached the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. And as we say here in Costa Rica, Buda Vida. Buda Vida. Thank you for joining us on the Share Recovery Podcast. To check out the show notes page on this interview or to thank our guests for sharing their story, go to www.thesharepodcast.com. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter to stay up to date on the latest news, podcasts, and interviews. Want to be one of our guests and share your story? Then go to our website and click on the Share Your Story button. We share our inspiring recovery stories every Tuesday. So subscribe to our show on iTunes or Stitcher Radio to get your free weekly download. We'll see you then. The opinions shared on this show reflect those of the individual speaker.